welcome to the stage, dear party people. This is uh, the Chaos West stage, self-organized uh, sessions. And the next talk will be held um, by Injan, a very good friend of mine. As you can see, he makes funny face movements. It will be um, about uh, scripting, and he has a special um, effect for us, the Sokat Ring of Fire. Darf ich mich neben dich setzen? Ja, du hast ihn neben mir setzen. Just one? Ah, yeah, there it is. All right. Um, I sit down, but I will stand up soon. So, uh, Nanook asked me to tell, me, tell something about this absolutely brilliant title, which is called Habitual Automation. What I mean by this is actually that I, at some point in my life, realized that I can't help it, but... <laughs> like this? As if you wanted to eat it. Your microphone is off. Uh, all right. Um, that I can't help it, but start to script stuff um, instead of just doing it. So I ended up uh, wasting days of my life or uh, wasting away days of my life um, to script very simple tasks to automate them like creating a curriculum vitae um, instead of just writing it down a small table have a curriculum vitae and the next time I need it which is not that often um, just do it again and work it over. Um, and at another point, somewhere later, I realized I actually didn't waste that time. It was actually time well spent and everybody who is not doing it the same way is losing out. So I, um, at some point, created this table, which, uh, this, uh, this title, which actually should have become um, a, a whole table around here, but, well, that will come up next time. And at that point I decided I want to share this uh, with all of you because uh, maybe some of you are in the same situation or some of you are even in the situation that you're still thinking that you're wasting away your time scripting stuff. And the other thing is that I want to motivate you which is probably preaching to the converted but uh, that's the most fun because you don't get that many arguments from them and you don't get hurt. Alright, and then I thought alright let's hijack my own talk um, and that's what I'm doing now. Um, the other thing we wanted to do around here is has actually to do with scripting and automating stuff that should not be automated um, and that we call the ring of fire for reasons that will become obvious to you in a few minutes or in a few seconds. The first thing I need you to do and you can do that over the next 20 minutes uh, is to start your engine which is your computers uh, as long as you don't have a free BSD running around because tests failed on every free BSD and if one of your computers is failing the whole ring of fire will be failing which is uh, probably the, the thing that uh, has to do with the structure of a ring. If you have a ring, a ring of fire for example if any of the ring links is failing, the whole ring is fire, uh, failing. So the general idea of this ring of fire is uh, that we do something very non uh, no, very important. It, it is sending around packets. And we only want to send around one package, which is a UDP package. And the content is, um, I can disclose this to you, is fire because every one of you is seeing it on your screens uh, very soon at the end of the talk. So. Um, please open up your computers, open up a command line interface if you have so. If you have not installed SoCut, I have not written it down here, but uh, if you know what, uh, uh, no, if you don't have installed SoCut, which is the thing you find on the upper right here, then please install this. And you, if you have not installed TCP dump, which is the thing down here, uh, then please do so over the next 10 minutes. The other thing you should do is join the ISC chat on the hack int, which you should do nonetheless because the 34C3 um, chat is also situated there. I'm sorry, I apologize. Oh, do you want to take the call? No, I do not. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and then post your IPv4 address, sorry, no v6 around here yet, um, in the uh, internet relay chat. That's not a really private data uh, set because, um, well, you will be changing your IP address soon afterwards. Can everybody who has a, anybody who has a computer on his lap 
that is somehow able to run so card races hand? All right. Thank you, then uh, proceed. Okay. In the beginning of everything, uh, you all probably know, was the command line. The command line, um, I, I'd like to argue, is much, much, much more superior over the things that you find around offices everywhere in the world, uh, which is the graphical user interface, the thing where you use this taily thingy around here, and actually only one finger of your five-digit hand. I mean, you could nail down your hand on your mouse and have some clicking item around here, but you only need one finger. So what you have if you use the command line, obviously, is much, much more control and a much higher input bandwidth, because you have 10 fingers around there, you have a lot of keys, so you should at least be much faster, but you also have more control in terms of do, knowing, knowing what you're actually doing, because when you click on some icon that you have on your, your graphical user interface, you're actually executing some kind of command, but I, I doubt that most of the people who do, th do so know that they're actually just firing up a command on the command line or on some command line sensitive thing. The other thing is you have a much more interesting learn curve. curve. If you have a graphical user interface, everybody of you probably has observed this, um, you can do quite a bit on the graphical user interface from the start. It looks very fascinating. Everything is fine. You fire up your graphical user interface and you just click to something and something is happening. Then you move your mouse around and the mouse is moving around uh, and you are actually able to do stuff. Not much, but you're able to do stuff. Uh, if you start up a command line interface, it's quite the opposite. If you set, sit, uh, uh, put a kit in front of a command line interface, it probably will not be able to do anything from the start, except maybe at some point it will start typing stuff, and then it will get one response from the computer, which is command not found. Um, so this is kind of disappointing from the start. But if you then proceed on the command line, maybe finding out your first command, which is probably show me the contents of this directory and move to that directory, you slowly but continuously progress on your learning curve. While using graphical user interface, you at some point will hit something that feels like a wall because you will not be able to parameterize your, your clicks. You have only one finger after all. Um, you will not be able to do anything beyond clicking some somewhere there. And if you want to advance from there, you have to learn something completely new, some kind of shell command line interface, for example, um, where you have much more control over your commands, where you can use something like loops, like conditions, uh, and all the stuff. And from there on, you can progress. But first, you have to get beyond this wall. So why, in the beginning, start to learn one interface when you can just directly start with the other interface that is much, much more better. So, ah, oh, sorry, it is Ring of Fire. Has everybody found the, the IRC channel yet? All right, uh, I just go forward and go back to this slide every now and then. You don't have a computer on your lap. Why? Okay, the last reason why you actually should use your command line interface is um, because manuals on the graphical user interface suck. I don't know if you have realized this, but if you try to teach somebody, uh, probably on the internet, on your web page, how to actually use um, some kind of Windows machine or so, you actually end up posting a set of screenshots with your mouse pointer conveniently situated on some, uh, on some knob. And after a, a while, uh, you can, you're able to follow all these images. You have to find where is this mouse pointer on this image. Then you have to compare this with the image you have actually on the other screen. And then you have to move your mouse pointer to the, to the button, can click the button, and then you, you proceed to the next uh, step. The problem is, um, this changes fre frequently because it's, it's only the display, the show of the, the buttons and everybody changes the look and feel of his uh, uh, graphical user interfaces now and then. So you find a lot of, lot of aged uh, manuals on how to use the graphical user interface of 10 years before, uh, which actually doesn't help you with now. As compared to manuals on the command line, 
which provide to you, if you're lazy, some, some list of commands that you can just copy and paste, put into your command line and you're done. Or, on the other hand, something that you can grow on, learn on what is this command doing, what is that command doing, can I, can I change it? And if you need something else, you can just start from this set of commands and figure out how to make it red instead of blue or blue instead of red. So, as it happened to be, I, uh, as probably many people of you, had at some point do work. And uh, the command line interface brings you to, to the point where you're not that fast when you do things for the first time. So if you start to work, um, you have to somehow put yourself to the task of automating stuff. But once you automated stuff, um, you have them in your at least external memory. And that is another problem I have. I cannot remind, remember much of the programs and commands I ever used. But if I made the five minutes effort to put them into a shell script, I just have to look up the script, which is somewhere in my binary directory and which I can somehow find. So what, what I um, found by, by looking at my binary directory was a lot of interesting scripts that at one point helped me to learn actually stuff. So I learned to calculate interest rates somewhere in my life because I borrowed money from a friend and I want to pay him back some, some money and there's a script telling me how to write interest uh, rates. That's not very interesting but at another point I found out how to copy files without deleting all the dupl duplicates or without um, without uh, deleting duplicates or copying over stuff that is already there. So that's very useful but I probably have forgotten how to do it. I just have to look up my script. Hello. Hello. Hi, Kolya. <laughs> I hope you haven't been incognito here. Um, all right. Other things that are very important is, for example, other script that I found myself looking up now and again is how to get a video into some kind of music. Did anybody of you know YouTube? They're nice videos, they're very bulky if you download them and if you only need the music, you can just comp uh, encode them into, um, into a music file. But en Mencoder or Mplayer has a lot, a lot of parameters. So if you found your set of parameters and you can remember them two years after, you're lucky, I am not. So I have them in a script. Um, probably the most important script was to get my calendar dates which you often get by email in ICS into my task warrior, which is managing all my tasks or has been managing all my tasks. Or you want to kill all the people who, is, who are tedious and are sending you email, probably with a nice message telling them back that you don't read their emails anymore, which is uh, a little bit more polite. So you put this in a script, uh, wasted two years of your lifetime, but from then time on, you don't have to read all these emails from tedious people you don't want to read emails from, and you're not even impolite because, well, you tell them that you don't read their emails every time they send you an email. Or very easy, if you have children, they need a command that says hello to them on their computer. That is a simple al alias one-liner. Ah, well, and the most fascinating thing I probably ever did was writing a markdown EU research proposal and working it over with a bash script to make a really actual PDF out of it and collaborate with 12 people. The script is st still somewhere around and I got some kind of praise for that. That's nice, but it's more or less kind of one-liners. If you go on from that, you find yourself probably sometimes having talks somewhere to present somewhere here uh, and you have yourself traveling, so you need your computer to be in a certain state. And the thing that evolved with me over a certain time is the shell script that actually set this screen up there. I, well, you cannot read it, but it's not important. You don't want to re read shell code on, in a talk nonetheless. So what, what do you do? You have a, a shell script. Let's call it scheme.sh. And this can do everything from setting up your X render to present actually these slides to bring up your office setup if you have a coffee machine that is internet aware, probably to cook your coffee. Uh, making your screen be an upside down, because I don't know how many of you remember the correct parameters to make your screen upside down, but now you have your one customized script to do so. And being mobile in general, for example, switching off your Tor proxy because it uh, draws your battery and so on. Uh, and you can put up everything on that on GitHub. 
so uh, everyone else can be completely confused by your shell code. What did I learn from that? Actually, I had to learn how to find out which monitor on my computer automa in an automated way is actually the presenting monitor and which one is the monitor up there. Um, and now I have forgotten how to do so, but I have a script to look it up again. Which brings me probably to the most useless thing I've written up to now, which is the science organizer. Um, I'm probably like uh, many people, meeting people sometimes. I am actually people, at least the last time I, I looked into the mirror I was no robot. Um, I go to conferences every now and then, like those here, and I meet people there. Um, people write texts, they send me emails, they make pictures, they create stuff. And I have a problem with people because I cannot actually remember very well who I met every time I meet somebody, um, when I met them and what they did. So I wanted somebody to help me with this and this somebody has to be my computer because there's nobody else around. Um, and so it all began in a, in a sense. It's completely unfinished, I have to add. So I started with an RDF database because, I mean, linked data is hot shit, so we have to use it. It makes things compl more complicated, but at least you have one format how to do all your stuff, and I wanted to try that. So we go there, and the simplest thing you can, have to, can do is do an address book. After all, I wanted to remember people. Uh, so I have some text file in there, which is in turtle format and a lot of people in there, which I still have to add manually, which is a hassle, but after all, you don't, you're, at least you're not forgetting how to write your RDF data. Um, then I needed a curriculum vitae, and that is actually something that it can do. It needs all my addresses that I had in the past. I don't want to delete stuff, so I put in all my addresses. Every address has some kind of begin and end date, because sometimes I move and then I leave my thing. You need all the events, and you will find out that all the RAF people had not yet defined all your curriculum VT in that detail, so you have to put them in yourself. If you write stuff, you have publications, you want them to show, be shown on your CV or in your web page and so on, so you have to put everything in there in your database. So creating your database actually already takes a lot of time instead of, well, firing up Word, creating a table, use it once, and next time you need a CV, create it again. Um, it works kind of nice. Um, it works kind of nice in the sense that my current address is actually my current address in my CV. It works less well in the sense that my publications actually come from a big BibTeX file that I have to convert into RDF and then have to convert into my CV. But, well, it kind of works. Um, last time it took me, let's say, four hours to rework my scripts and then ten minutes to have my CV ready. <laughs> ah, and it took me two minutes to enter my new address. So, Science Organizer, it's called, you find it actually on GitHub because um, I am very afraid that at some point my f hard disk will break down and I will not find it again, so I put it up on GitHub. It's not that complete, but you probably want to use it. What it can do is actually um, create my CV. I used it at least twice in my life yet, so it probably saved me about minus 20 hours. <laughs> And it can do a friend of a friend enriched web page for me, which is probably read by nobody because it's somewhere in the me.rdf file that nobody will be searching on my web page. But it's nice nonetheless to have something like that. And after all, the um, European research proposal I wrote had something to do with that. So uh, I needed to create something to be a little bit more coherent with which, what I wanted to research. Uh, but what it should be in the end, um, is a complete social network plugin. Uh, m most of you, like me, probably have one or two identities on social networks and I want to distribute everything to those social networks because I'm lazy and I don't want to write everything twice. Have, has anybody of you ever written a publication and then find himself writing in it in a BibTeX file, then on his, I don't know, social network A list, social network B list, and in the end in his company on this uh, publication list, I did so, I wanted to, to make things easier, but it's not yet working. But nonetheless, I get my publication file and I write them still manually. Um, I actually wanted to do a contact publication graph. It's in the making. And I want to find out who I me met at conference XYZ somewhere in 1960-whatever-ish could have been. 60. I met you. I probably recognize that. 
What uh, actually was created is the thing you cannot see around that. The code on the right side is creating my curriculum vitae. So that is working, it's working kind of kind of nice. You only have to write down the sections you want to have and then you're finished. Uh, if you entered your data beforehand and nothing breaks down. Which brings me back to the original reason. I actually learned kind of a bit on that. Um, for example, on writing the science organizer, or still writing the science organizer, I, I learned programming Haskell uh, up to a level that I now want to rewrite everything I wrote up to there because in the beginning everything was kind of modeled. Um, I learned quite a little bit of bash scripting, I learned kind of a little bit of Ruby uh, because my email client was written in Ruby at that time. I learned kind of a bit of Python and in the end I never lost contact to my computer which happens if you write papers and not code. So. Um, that brings me to the conclusion that probably, hopefully, nobody of you needs. Um, if you learn to code, um, you can put stuff into algorithms. If you can stuff into algorithms, then you, in the end, can test whether you finally have understood what you have been doing. Because, uh, as Richard Feynman put it, um, you only understand uh, yeah, you, what you cannot create, you do not understand. Or the contra uh, point, point is, if you can create it, you probably have understood it. So if you try to create stuff like your curriculum vitae, you at the end will recognize that your CV is nothing more than a list of sections that somehow has to be compiled. If you knew that beforehand, you're lucky. I uh, actually learned it there. So now we come to the final point. Um, can I get a show of hand who has fired up a computer and somehow find himself able to uh, connect to the IRC client? All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, if I leave myself out, we are seven potential points of failure. <laughs> Let me squid, switch to the... Uh, can you hold that for me? Okay. Yeah. Can, you, can you enlarge this? Can you, can you enlarge this, this in any way? All right. Uh, you're all in the IRC chat. So the title of the IRC chat is the actual line that you have to insert into into your shell. It's um, actually the the last input I put in there. If you want to watch what we're doing now, you need. Uh, sorry. You need this last line here. I have, I, I try it. Ah, okay, yeah, try, try to make it. Whoa. Does that work? Ed, you probably can read that now. This is the final test of a very useless exercise. <laughs> Um, so, what will, will happen? If, if, we, um, if you can paste your IP address in the, in the ISC, then we create a list of IP addresses. You locate your IP address in the chat window and below your uh, own IP address, you find the next IP address. The next IP address you insert here after UDP4 datagram and before the 70, uh, 73 port number. This is the peer that you will forward your packets to. Then you fire your SOCAT line. Maybe, maybe uh, Yannick, can you put up your, email, your IP address in Okay. Ah. I'm not seeing it. Ah, it's not working. Shit.
Yeah, but it it's not helping. Obviously, my internet failed. Yeah, I'm completely offline. Okay, can, can you can you start this? Okay, of the people who have have their IP entered their IP address, can you find your IP address? Yannick, can you insert your your IP address as the last one? Ah, now I'm online again. I. Um, okay. Who has I uh, started the SoCard line with the correct IP address now? This is. Yeah, correct. We we will see in a second. <laughs> Two. I need three. Down there, somebody is typing. I never wanted to comment sports, so that's Yannick is done. Who has the TCP dump running? That's the only way you see something because my computer off obviously is offline. I need I need some some line from down there still. Hello. Ah, oh, Yannick, just try it. Does anybody need another explanation? I need all the IP addresses, but I don't have them in the IRC chat anymore, so we lost that. We had interconnection when I started to talk. <laughs> Who ever heard of lost internet connections on the... On the con it works! You have sent a package that's coming round? Are you seeing packages? No? You have seen packages? Once or twice? Four times. So it came round four times? Four? Who's the, who, who has seen packages? Or every time you see a package, raise your hand. <laughs> Six? It works? Yes. Woo! Thank you, everybody. <laughs> All right. What did work? Uh, actually, so what happened? <laughs> Who wants to know what happened? All right. Uh, some volunteers. I don't have a graph, but we can, can imagine some kind of a circle. So we had a bunch of volunteers here, everybody with, armed with a computer, and computer A set up a proxy port, something that receives messages on one port and sends them forward to the next, let's call it computer B. Computer B did nothing else than sending the packages it's, re it's receiving to computer C, to computer D. And computer D decided that it's very intelligent to route them back to computer A. So what happens if anybody uh, has the clever idea to insert a packet at any point of the ring? Well. The packet starts to go from A to B to C to D and then starts again to A to B to C to D to A to B to C to D at infinitum if you're lucky. So in the end, um, if your message contains, for example, the word fire, you're now um, entitled, entitled to listen to Johnny Cash until you stop your computer. <laughs> Um, I thank everybody who participated. I wanted to make that work in some way. Um, and, by the way, you learn to, to use SoCut in a, some kind of way to forward your packages. And I hope you learned something new. If not, you hopefully learned something like uh, that it's not very useful to uh, link your computers in a circle. <laughs> it still works. Aye, keep it up. <laughs> Any questions, by the way? Nanook, it's your task. And thank you for listening. Questions from the audience? Nah, I didn't expect questions. Then um, I will... I what, will what, what's the most useless thing you ever coded? <laughs> oh, um, actually that code is not um, from me, it's from you. 
Uh, <laughs> once on the Congress, I left my computer open just like that. Yeah. And then you open the terminal and add it to my bash file to say, you should lock your computer every time you leave your computer. That's not useful. That's a very useful reminder. <laughs> So if we do not have any um, questions, questions from the audience, uh, my last question is, um, where can we find you if we have questions concerning SOCART, CVs, rich data text files? Ah, yeah, I forgot my... Well, you, you find me on the internet somewhere. Um, yeah, I'm from Bremen, and you probably find me around there. Or uh, if you're very lucky, you find me down in the kids space where I'm lounging around in some of the hammocks or uh, in the... What's belle but in English? Ball bath. <laughs> <laughs> With all the funny balls. Um, nah. Okay, yes. Thank you again for, your, for, for listening, for coming here. And good luck wasting your time on code. It's very, 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 very funny. <laughs> thank you.